public health, because I'm an archaeologist, I'm not an anthropologist, is politicians came along, county supervisors, passed a law that no fossil from Orange County can leave. So, LA County, LA County Museum could even go down there and help us. Wow. So today, after 30 years, it's at the Cooper Center, still in plastic jackets, falling apart. So I understand the politics. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I could sidebar that, a lot of you folks who drive the 110 freeway know about Heritage Square on the side. Mm -hmm. There's the Octagon House. Mm -hmm. That came from the city of Pasadena. And when Pasadena learned that the city of Los Angeles was yanking their one and only octagon house, they quickly passed an ordinance that said, no house can be moved outside of our city limits. <laughs> so, politics reigns eternal. So, yeah. How much do you suppose that weighs this goal? You got an idea? Take a guess. <laughs> I, I don't think any of us have a very good idea. I mean, you saw probably a dozen people that could drag it right. relatively easily. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, I can't even guess. Okay. Uh, I would guess 1,000 to 1,200 pounds. Okay. Yeah. All in all. So now that you're more familiar with the political setting there, and you know who you should partner with, have you been back? Well, we wouldn't dare go back. No. <laughs> really? <laughs> One of the things that, uh, no, we haven't, mm -hmm. um, as a group, gone back. But like I said, some members of our team have gone back and uh, done both biological surveys and work that way, and then uh, paleontological work. And a pair of students went back and dug in that same location. There was a cave that was a um, ceremonial cave, and they did the excavation for that. Um, and, and it was it had um, things like condors and eagles and all these things all displayed inside. Mm -hmm. And so we have not done that, but members of that team have gone back. Mm -hmm. But you were taking students down fairly regularly, right? Oh, yeah. And then this was just the end of that for you? No, we, we kept doing that for about another seven years after we did this, the students' trips. Okay. And, and other research trips. We had a yeah, we did a lot of research trips down there as well. But the uh, we didn't excavate anything anymore. We did scout locations. We found dinosaur bones and other things, and we would always give GPS the coordinates and give that to the to the anthropology. <laughs> 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 yeah. so that's so did um, did anybody inherit this um, PCC summer field program, or is it still going on? As well? No, it's a, it it. It, when we we stopped doing it for a while, um, the um, the State Department, you know, uh, issues certain levels of priority to different countries, and then for a while they were issuing that for Mexico, where they didn't recommend travel mm -hmm. uh, in rural locations. So uh, our board of trustees said, you know, maybe we should put that on hold. Now, uh, just so we did, and then it just never really got started up again. Um, Dr. Carter retired. Um, and, and so it, there's a few new professors, however, who I talked to recently and are interested in actually restarting that up, a geography professor and uh, an anthropologist. So it may start up again soon. And may I uh, jump on that too, that um, those two cats that uh, Mr. DiPiori is talking about, um, they are very enthusiastic about the American field trip studies which completely blow the minds of Estudiante. They're, they, they get out there in the Great Basin and Range and they see the Grand Tetons and the, the Board of Trustees are happy to deal with those within the American boundary. But you know, once you go south and you know, Baja and Mexico has got such a bad rap and it is arguably very dangerous um, that, that they feel like they can't support that thing quite yet, but we'll uh, hold, hold out hope. <laughs> yeah, another question. So it, uh, I'm assuming this is like, it's like a solid piece of rock. I mean, it's not, uh -huh. I mean, it's all completely filled in. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's sand, sand and sand calcium. Sand. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. But let me say that <coughs> the the ash and cinder is mm -hmm.
very crumbly and very uh, easy to uh, dig. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, it's the same stuff that uh, Rome, <coughs> the city of Rome, was constructed out of that. Uh -huh. Because there was a major eruption in, oh, probably 40 miles away from Rome okay. that spread ash and cinder through a broad area and it's easy to cut and make blocks out of. And so what they did to construct many of the Roman era buildings was make blocks of those things, big thick blocks, stack them together, and then put a thin layer of marble on the outside. So all these marble buildings you will see if you visited Rome are really have a core of that soft crumbly rock that is coated with the marble. Or was coated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. well, I know some's falling off. A lot of the marble's taken yeah. off. So, uh, yeah. I was just wondering how many people in your whole group had prior paleontology experience or training on how to excavate or how to undertake something like that? We had one professor at <laughs> Pasadena City College who uh, we talked her into going down with us uh, because she knew the plastering, the, the jacketing yeah. technique. Mm -hmm. And so she was invaluable. She had not been part of the program in previous years, but uh, we that's, did use her. That's my kind of trip. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't completely yeah. made it up as we went, and it was amazing all the talents that emerged from people, all those people, yeah. 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 luckily. Where did the femur end up? That's probably in the museum in uh, Ensenada. We gave everything back to the, uh, we, we did take a few pieces north with us that we, we drilled and took samples to get the carbon-14 dates, which never mm -hmm. came back, and then we sent all the material back. I think the last of the bones went back just maybe a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Gregorio Pacheco, once again, mm -hmm. sort of mediated that for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But it was interesting because word of the <laughs> discovery of this uh, mammoth spread up and down the Baja Peninsula. Right. Right. Within two days, right. everybody anywhere in Baja knew about it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we were written up in the local paper <laughs> after the cops chased us off <laughs> as these rapacious, uh, evil North Americans <laughs> who, <Fossil robbers. laughs> who were robbing them of their natural patrimony. And so, uh, and, and we knew that. Uh, the next day, the very next newspaper published said, oh, we were actually good guys because we had gotten permission and so on. But, and then they kind of demonized the various police agencies there. But as we left that episode, the next day, we knew that everybody knew that we had dug out some mammoth bones. Mm. So halfway to the border, Russ was pulled over. It was a very distinctive vehicle. <laughs> and, um, he, and, and they said, we want to see what you've got. So they went through and they found the mammoth jaw, jaw I think it was, the one intact thing that we took back across the border uh, before taking it back to the university. And so the cops, uh, the federales, I think, had taken that. They took it back inside and said, well, <coughs> we'll talk to you later. But then half an hour later, they brought the bone back and said, well, you can go on, but you'll hear from us again. So uh, we went back to the U.S., uh, I think rather uncomfortably. Probably. <laughs> well, to be, to be perfectly honest, we were arrested three times on the way back to the border. Every province, uh, every township we passed through set out a roadblock oh, and, and arrested us and took pictures for their local paper 
pointing guns at us like they were arresting us. So every single, and it was just like, oh, there's the roadblock. Here we go all over. We'd all get out, and they'd take pictures of us at gunpoint. And then they'd say, okay, go. Okay, go. And then they'd get arrested again and again and again. So uh, it, I was, <laughs> yeah, if you're wondering about the press, I guess that's how it works. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm sorry, there was a, a question, gentleman in the hat. Uh, you might have already answered this, but was the male, uh, was the man was male or female? Wow, that's interesting. Probably a male, but impossible to tell. The skull by itself we couldn't tell, but the tusks were rather large, and they had that full mm. arch yeah. that you'd expect in the males, right? The females do not have that. And they may have been crossed yeah. in the hillside. Yeah. So uh, when, when this guy checked out and went back into the hillside, lay down flat, it may be that his tusks, and that's why when we were in our um, time is of the optimum, we need to, we decided to leave the tusks in the hillside because we didn't know that they would be straight, that they would be curved and crossed, mm -hmm. and so we said, we'll leave those here, we'll take what we came for, and, uh, and got up on it. <laughs> All before the sun went down. <laughs> yes. And he, uh, idea of the age of the animal when it died? Oh wow, no, it was a full adult, there was a lot of wear on the molar, so, um, you know, uh, it's hard to say, but it was fully adult and, you know, not, not, not very young. <coughs> Anybody else? So, actually below that, just below this, that layer, um, uh, there are some marine fossils in and about the area. Um, not, not right there, but in, in and around the area. And so, um, it was probably a, a moderate sort of semi-interglacial, you know? I mean, if you go back 120,000 years, there's a big interglacial period. And then there's a number of smaller interglacials, one at I think 44,000, et cetera. And this was definitely as the climate was warming this last time. So it, it was as this new interglacial period was just beginning, probably. But we couldn't get any forams or anything from that. You're right, yeah, to know for sure. And if I can get on that too, that uh, I asked Dr. Carter at that time, hey, when this guy keeled over, turned upside down and died, where was the seashore? Because we were on the bluff. I mean, this was, the, the rest of the body was gone, and all we had left was the skull in the, in the bluff. And he said, Dr. Carter, if I remember correctly, said it was probably three to four miles away from here. <laughs> there also were, um, <laughs> this, is, this is a rather sad part of the story, but there were also uh, putative um, butcher marks on the skull that we found out about afterwards when the Anthropology Museum opened up part of it and was looking, they felt that there were actually marks in there that indicated that it may have been butchered by humans. Mm -hmm. Now, we never heard anything more about that, but that would definitely make it a, a fairly recent thing. Mm -hmm. so. Other questions? Yeah, yeah was, was, that, was there a lot of volcanic activity at that time, or was that one of the last big volcanic activities? <laughs> Yeah, from about 120,000 years ago to the youngest was 18,000 years ago. There are a series of maybe uh, 12 or 15 shield volcanoes capped by cinder cones, and it was a, 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 an explosion out of the youngest of those cinder cones that buried this mammoth and the other bones that are found in that area. What was the fate of the juvenile skull, given that it was so badly, badly damaged? You know, uh, Greg took that, that back to the Anthropology Museum as well. Um, yeah, so it's there, there. I don't know what happened to that. It wasn't. It was only about that big. Um, mm -hmm. It was not very big at all. Yeah. Uh, do you ever give this individual mammoth a nickname? At all? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> There's a song in there. <laughs> Think print. <laughs> Other questions? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, the male or the bull might be older, he has a full set of ivory, would that make him a tusker? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, actually. Yeah, that seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. Are most of the megafauna found in Baja are they herbivores mostly, or find carnivores, saber tooth cats, anything like that? Wow. Uh, you know, in San Quentin, uh, ourselves and the other folks that have done excavations there have found mostly herbivores, mm -hmm. bison, camels, um, and uh, and the mammoth. We also found a lot of smaller animals, mm -hmm. but I don't think in the, in those beds we found any predators or evidence of that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they were there. Yeah. You kind of expect that, right? Herbivores are found in greater, much greater abundance than any of the carnivores. But I thought there were some carnivore bones in that uh, lava cave. Yeah. Just up uh, a few hundred meters up the cliff. Right. So the ceremonial cave definitely had mountain lion, it had a wolf, it had all kinds of strange things in it. I'm not sure that they ever quite figured that out. Yeah. Everything from whale bones to otters to all kinds of things were all in this one little cave. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a ceremonial thing. That was not a, a, a paleontological mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Is it wary that charming young man that was in the picture with the two women? Oh, my son. <laughs> yeah, my son who was actually on this dig as well. He was in high school at that time. He's uh, just finishing his PhD in geology. Yeah. He'll, be, uh, he'll be the state geologist of Idaho this coming year. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, and, and of my two daughters you saw in the film, one of them is a geologist in Colorado. In Colorado. Yeah. 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 At the La Brea Tar Pit, their uh, museum goes back maybe 10 to about 55,000 years. Does that kind of account for Baja? When you go beyond that, it gets more of the marine fossils beyond that time limit? Or? Well, there are, um, y you can go back. We found dinosaur bones mm -hmm. in Baja, the El Rosario Formation. Mm -hmm. So there are terrestrial deposits from further back. Mm -hmm. But kind of understanding the geography of that, Baja was then attached to the mainland of Mexico and much further south. Mm -hmm. So it was a totally different province, totally different ge geography. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the only reason you can see the dinosaur bones is because these canyons are so damn deep, just, you know, towering on each side. And it's only down at the very bottom that you find these dinosaur bones. So it's always been mm -hmm. kind of the... Uh, um, the geologist dream to uh, walk down the riverbed and kind of keep your eye out, see what you can see, see what weathered out, and it's always swell to come by after a giant big flash flood rainstorm, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's all this new stuff exposed. Mm -hmm. So you can dig a hole, or you can walk the river bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but we always tried to avoid finding good dinosaur bones. Because with a group of students, each of whom wants to pick up a souvenir, you really don't want them to be poking around in significant uh, dinosaur uh, bones. So we did find several places, and we did GPS them and give them to the Natural History Museum. But we stuck deliberately to the ones that were completely crumbling away where every student could get a little bone but didn't destroy anything significant. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Oh, sure. yeah. sorry. It seemed like until you did your, your, your prospecting, the, the community had little interest in the fossils until you showed up and started extracting them. Yeah. Right, yeah, that was, your, I, yeah. Um, and, and that might be just because it, people aren't necessarily aware of what they are, right? Mm -hmm. Because many of these large mammal bones look like they might have been from a cow or mm -hmm. something else. Right. I mean, except the skull, of course, but that was weathering out. But if you find a chunk of a femur or something, these people live in a rural environment, bones are not unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hard to say that they stay. Yeah. So you said that there was only one person with excavation experience out of like the 12 or so people that were there. What types of experiences were there in that group of people? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of our members um, works
for Hollywood movies, and she's a rigger. She rigs lines for moving heavy things. Um, she's cool. Yeah. Asked her. She's yeah. in Australia now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Sold off her stuff and left the, left the state. Right. And, and Richard is a computer programmer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. That's a big Now, you know what it was, to answer your question, or at least give some insight, was that uh, we all understood that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And the call came in, and it's kind of like Hollywood Union. If you, if you don't take that last call, they're never going to call you again. Mm -hmm. And I think we all kind of felt like that. Like, um, when I found the femur, Mr. DeFiore went back and he said, where'd you find that? I said, there's these two palm trees right there. And it was only about 20 feet from where we parked the truck. And so we knew that right underneath of those two twin palms, there was this thing. And he came back on his own and then came back and said, okay, kids, we're doing spring break in Baja, and here's what we're going to do. And, and each and every participant was hand-selected, and it was really not so much about their, um, their work history. It was about their attitude, that it was, can we all get along, and can we just kind of hit this thing with both barrels, all eight cylinders, all at once, all of us together, and we did. And so I, I don't think it's so much about the work experience, but as I've said this at Studiente through the years, it, say yes and then figure it out. You know, get time off of work, throw together your savings, and get on the road. Go. Go and do it. Just do it. So. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys very much. You guys make me want to be a part of the group now. So <laughs> that's an all email invite for us all just to hang out. Okay. But that's a really awesome story, though, and especially all those different people with diverse backgrounds coming together for a common goal. And my mantra at work is always say yes when people ask me, how do we be successful? And I was like, well, don't do what I do. Not successful. But say yes when people ask you to do something. So, you know, great. So what we're going to do now is, um, as per usual, we'll take break here in a few. Um, reminder about the raffle tickets if you'd like to buy some of those. Um, also, the club t-shirts, be back. Yeah. We'll have club t-shirts up at the front of one of the tables. If you guys want to come up, peruse those, maybe purchase. Um, talk to Carol. And, is that all right? Mm -hmm. Find you. Sure. And then, of course, if you guys don't mind, they'll be around for maybe a few minutes, and you can mingle and talk. We would maybe like to take a picture of you guys up front, if that's okay with you as well, one or two. Um, but um, that is pretty much it. And after the break, say about 10, 15 minutes the most, we'll, we'll start the business portion of the meeting and oh. we'll run through that. Oh, if you are attending the Mar Marble Mountain trip, um, Mr. Ed Classer would like you to come up and take a look at the um, list to make yes. sure your email is correct. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you could do that too on break, that would be appreciated. But that's it for now. And I'm excited to see what other hats are coming out. I'm really now that I have to figure that out. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone.